the current status of uterine artery embolization for fibroids. Lecture delivered for the Sri Lankan College of Radiologists in the year 2007 during the annual conference. Leomyomas, commonly called fibroids, arise from the smooth muscles and of the components of the extracellular matrix. Leomyomas are estrogen sensitive tumors and they have estrogen receptors in them. This thing is important because when we plan treatment for fibroids, we must understand that when a patient is reaching the perimenopausal age, the chances of a fibroid size increasing becomes very low. Now let's have a look at this slide. We talk these tumors are estrogen are sensitive. So what happens? It would increase in pregnancy and decrease during menopause and during hormone replacement therapy there's a possibility that they may grow and there's a possibility that they may remain stationary but they may not shrink. What are the symptoms that are associated with fibroids? One, because they are generally vascular there is venous congestion and the patient may have heavy prolonged menstrual periods. They may find that their monthly period has changed. It may come more frequently. They may find there is increased pain or there will be some change which they will talk about. They may have anemia because of the excessive bleeding that is associated with large vascular fibroids. They may complain of more pain. This can either be because of the clots or because of the vascular congestion itself. They may talk about pressure or discomfort in the pelvis. A feeling of heaviness is what they complain very often. They may talk about pain in the back and the sides of the leg. This is again explained by venous congestion and these dilated veins can press upon the nerve roots as they exit the sacral, uh, uh, the sacral plexus. Then of course people may have dyspareunia which can also be a complaint because of the mass effect or because of venous congestion. Now when the fibroid is large it can press on the bladder and then the patient will complain of frequency. The inability to hold large volumes of urine is a complaint in this group. Sometimes if the fibroid is low it compresses against the neck of the bladder and they may present to us with acute retention of urine. If the fibroid is posterior it will press against the rectum and the patient will come complaining of constipation, bloating or other symptoms associated with compression on the bowel. Then of course we'll have a group of patients who actually tell you that my abdomen is getting larger and clinically they may have large palpable masses sometimes of a 24 weeks or a 26 weeks pregnancy. Now let's have a look at how we would classify fibroids. If it is present under the outermost wall of the fibroid we would call it a subserosal. Then we'll have fibroids that are in between the muscle layers itself and we will call it intramural. Another group may be lying under the mucosa and we will call it submucosal. Then it could be based on the location where it is on the fundus we will call it fundal or if it is cervical we will call it cervical. Sometimes you may have a fibroid polyp which is a submucosal fibroid which is pedunculated and prolapses right out of the uterine cavity. Now one of the issues when we talk about the fibroids are, are they malignant? Now many many people go around with the fear that they are malignant but let us see what literature says. This is from the American College of Gynecologists Technical Bulletin 
of 1994, it says that leomyosarcoma is a tumor that arises de novo. In other words, a leomyosarcoma starts as a tumor, a malignancy from the first cell itself. The second thing is leomyosarcomas are tumors which are seen in the fifth and sixth decade of life. It's not a tumor seen in the 30s and 40s when fibroids are the commonest. Now when we talk about treating fibroids, we have to understand that fibroids are very, very common tumors. They're kind of akin to gray hairs that people get as they grow old. If tiny fibroids are included, then virtually every woman will have at least one by menopause. In Caucasians, 25 to 30 percent will reach a significant size. In Africans, the percentage is higher. In about 50 percent of them, they will reach a significant size. This is from the Mayo Clinic Center for Fibroid Guidelines. So why are we talking this? What we are trying to say is fibroids is so common and if only some of them are symptomatic, then we can't say that it should be treated like any tumor in the uterus. Or for example, it should not be treated like any disease in the uterus. Asymptomatic fibroids need no treatment at all. Symptomatic fibroids should not be treated in the same league as a malignant tumor by hysterectomy. We are after all treating a benign lesion which is very very common. So now that we know that fibroids should ideally not treated by hysterectomy, so what are the choices? The choices are so many that it often is confusing. We have open myomectomies laparoscopic myomectomies, laser myomectomies, hysteroscopic myomectomies, hormonal therapy, uterine fiber embolization, and I can go on. In the end of the day, what I have is an extremely confused patient. So I have to know where exactly would I place each of these treatment options. So let's talk about uterine fiber embolization. In 1995, we had the first results reported by Ravina, we know that they were doing this procedure more to reduce bleeding before myomectomy and ended up seeing patients having no symptoms and reduction in size. In 1997, it was Goodwin and MacLucas who brought about their series and by 1999, there are others who started confirming and repeating the same findings that the uh, French group and the American. By 2003, we had 11 series with 2,126 patients. Patient per, per study was 193 and the duration was somewhere around a little more than a year. Today, in 2007, 8, 9, we are talking of thousands and thousands of people who are being treated every day by fibroid embolization. Now why is it such a great procedure? Let's just compare the fibroid related quality of life measures. So what is it? Look at this graph. When we compare this with hysterectomy, you find that in every subsect the patient seems to have done better. If you see by three months it peaks up and stabilizes, whether it's general health, whether it's physical functioning or whatever it is. So we find that this is good because it actually makes a patient feel better. Now this we know is not the truth when we talk about embolization. So what are we saying then? Are we telling this evening that everyone with fibroids should be treated by embolization? Or are we telling we have a good procedure, so let's look at the definite indications for them.